So welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to start. No, oh, did you start recording? Yes, I did. Okay, I was confused. <laughs> Started magically. Um, so welcome to our third and final spring semester creative community conversation. Um, this one's extra special because we get to meet all of the faculty at the new school who are um, part of our faculty advisory committee for the graduate minor. Um, and they will all introduce themselves and their work. Um, and um, we're hopeful that we can continue this series next year. Um, but we'll take a, a break over the summer um, and maybe have some in-person, I don't know, not sure yet. The future is to be determined. Um, so with that, I will um, pass it over to Pablo and um, we'll get started. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you. I'm Pablo Guerra uh, and from the Miami program, the masters uh, that we have here at the, the new school in Copa. Um, it's uh, as Alex said, our last of our creative community conversations of the season. Uh, where we discuss a range of subjects from uh, creative placemaking to social practice uh, to community cultural development. And uh, today we are so excited to be with our uh, colleagues uh, that are faculty at COPA. And uh, we want to conclude this season with a subject that might seem very evident and very obvious. Um, but that is not perhaps discussed enough, which is the distance between theory and practice. For a professional in any field, I believe it's, uh, one is always aware of how uh, the world is different from how one learned it in school. Uh, the things that we have learned in the classroom sometimes don't feel enough when you actually go into the real world to, to practice what you have learned. Um, I often think about a famous thought experiment um, that is studied by um, philosophers and psychologists, usually uh, described as uh, Mary's room, in quotes. Uh, the thought experiment goes as follows. Mary is a scientist who lives in a black and white room. She studies color and knows everything there is to know scientifically about what color is, what perception is. And the question that the thought experiment poses is when she steps out of the room and finally sees the world in real color for the first time, is there something that she would know that she did not know before? This is a, a very complex and debated uh, philosophical problem, something connected to uh, a term known as physicalism. But it really is, I think, connected to the subject of, um, to me, being in school and being in real life. You know, being in school sometimes feels like that black and white room. Being in the world uh, as an artist or a cultural entrepreneur is like going into the full color world. One would argue or could argue perhaps that no education can prepare you for the real thing like Mary, while others might argue that experiencing something sensorially cannot really be taught. In other words, like experience is something that you cannot really teach. Um, yet we work every day uh, with making the theoretical real through practical examples. So we'll talk today about a little bit about what it means to uh, put theory into practice uh, when we are discussing uh, arts entrepreneurship, creative placemaking, uh, socially engaged art, or many other art forms that engage communities and the public or makes a practice, an artistic practice public. So we have an amazing group of uh, colleagues uh, today, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to be posting their uh, bios throughout the conversation uh, so that I don't overwhelm you with me reading every single one's biography, which is extensive and impressive. Uh, but uh, I'll just mention them very quickly now. We have Nikki Pombier Berger, who's an art oral historian, educator, and artist who works primarily in art, on arts-based community engagement projects. We have Juan Lee Carrion, who is an artist, researcher, and an activist whose work over the past decade has unfolded in the research, development, and education of community-engaged design and artistic practices, addressing social and environmental justice. We have Kevin McQueen, who, who has extensive experience in corporate finance with a deep commitment to facilitating social change through mission-driven organizations. Uh, uh, Jennifer Scott, who is an anthropologist, a public historian, and curator 
who has worked with a number of history centers, museums, arts and cultural organizations for over 25 years. And we have Emmanuel Oni, who is an architectural designer interested in using design as a catalyst for social change and has experience in the arts as a painter and arts facilitator. So welcome everybody. It's really fantastic to have you in conversation. And as I initially um, suggested to the group um, uh, when we were planning this conversation, we thought that it would be nice to start with one prompt, uh, a simple question, which is, um, when um, if they could, we could, they could speak from their experience where knowing something in theory and making it happen in practice become two very different things. What is getting lost when you come to a, at a problem from a purely theoretical versus a practical perspective? And with that, I'll turn it over to you guys to tell us a little bit about that question. And Nikki, you happen to be on the screen, so perhaps you might wanna start with this question. Is that okay? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see all of you. Um, and okay, so I have, I have, <laughs> as an oral historian, um, my practice has was radically changed in um, 2012 in ways that I think are actually my most <laughs> potent kind of offering for this question of the difference between theory and practice. Um, I was in uh, graduate school, take two, at Columbia for oral history, and I, um, I gave birth to my second son, Jonah, and he was diagnosed with Down syndrome at birth and soon after with hearing loss and has since been diagnosed with autism, but that his birth really began my um, path towards encountering and then asking how we can expand the limits, the sort of theoretical and practical limits of, of oral history, which in theory is a field that I was drawn to for its um, radical inclusivity, this let's sort of drive to um, not just correct, but kind of upend um, history through the lived experience of people who are whose accounts are um, often unrecorded, marginalized, unseen, suppressed, um, you know, repurposed, appropriated, just sort of subject to capital H history. Um, and so, but when I had Jonah and I wanted to um, learn about uh, disability, learn about like my world, just, you know, the kaleidoscope on my world changed. And I was like, oh, I live in an ableist world. I had no, I had no idea. Um, why have I, why am I 32 years old and never had an, in, an encounter with a person with intellectual disability? Why have I never met someone with Down syndrome before giving birth to one? Um, which is a pretty intimate encounter. Um, and so as an oral historian, I wanted to learn about Down syndrome and disability through the, you know, by talking to people with Down syndrome. And um, so I changed my graduate thesis to, to, to work with people with Down syndrome and quickly came to sort of be troubled and want to trouble the the orality at the center of the practice of oral history because if we are we call ourselves radically inclusive but we only deal in um particular kinds of memory or particular ways of of show of expressing the self that all sort of center orality and lean heavily on sort of chronological memory we actually leave a lot of people out and it's not just people who don't speak or who whose modes of communication may challenge our tools, but it's all of the ways that um, everyone has of sort of giving an account of who they are that um, a recorder, an audio recorder might miss. Um, and so that began my work collaborating with artists and working in the space of sort of artistic, other artistic modes of um, both eliciting in a kind of a collaborative co-creative ethic that reflected what I what I've learned in oral history and what it means to sort of work oral historically with a community with um, you know different ways of, of documenting um, that go beyond the the audio record that all sounds really vague and I think what I what I want to suggest is that um, a theory of, of inclusion came into direct encounter with what its limits in practice would be. How do you do oral history with people who don't speak? And so I've been working with um, Temple University since 2014 on a range of different projects that try to um, take the part of oral history that is 
both theoretically and practically committed to um, inclusion <laughs> and inclusive um, accounts of the self and sort of seeing how centering those in the um, in the understanding of a particular history and and but working with the arts to expand what what we might mean as um, I don't know as an expression of self as a life history so a concrete I, maybe when we get to questions or more of a conversation I can offer some concrete examples of how that's played out in practice in a couple projects but in general with Temple we're working to document the history of um, the intellectual disability rights movement and and of institutionalization in Pennsylvania and so trying to put um, oral history into practice in ways that um, in, well co-creating with people who have lived experience of this history from sort of project design through interpretation to a public. So doing oral history with people who don't speak, that's like in a nutshell, my theory and practice conundrum. Thank you, Nikki, that's great, wonderful. Uh, let's go to Juan Lee. Thank you, Pablo. Um, so I think that the, the biggest difference or the biggest uh, experience that I, I went through in transitioning in my practice, perhaps it was coming from doing some social practice work, uh, some projects that they were more uh, temporary, if, if, if you wanna say, and trying to make those make that practice into a more sustainable long-term creative place making or community creative community development if you want uh practice and uh, <clears throat> basically to to do the summary as nikki just did like to put it in a nutshell uh is is basically to realize that doing community work is recognizing chaos as an operating system and uh, coming to terms with that, right? And how we all try to rationalize everything, structure everything, work with systems in everything, try to create formulas, strategies, and try to, you know, like have a plan. We always have a plan to, to do things and to execute and to conquer. Mm -hmm. And how those plans, um, never work like that that was like that that was my my biggest realization and to give you an example like a practical real case sample it was i was working on doing uh the first uh one of my projects is building uh gardens as platforms to to address um social inequity and uh, different conflicts in community in underserved communities and i did some of these gardens temporary as part of like working with art institutions and, and other uh cultural institutions uh or public agencies and governmental agencies they were all temporary and when you work temporary it's easier to plan because there is an end there is always an end, there is a goal, uh, it's going, something is going to finish. So transitioning from that to creating the first permanent garden and uh, that it was going to stay there and it was going to belong to a community for a long term, uh, it was quite a challenge. And it was when I realized that you have to embrace chaos and chaos has to be your modus operandi. Right, so that's how you have to do, and that's how you have to work. And uh, I actually use <clears throat> this analogy in my classes, and I, I talk about I talk about quantum physics and uh, the butterfly effect, and how we can translate spooky action at a distance to community engagement, and how those things <laughs> correlate to each other. Uh, but basically, just to like give you the, the example, the particular example, it was that I like, I remember in the, in, the, in the gardens that I used to do that they were temporary, I will do roughly around 
five to six months of community engagement to reach out to community members, stakeholders, and such. And that should be sufficient to create the connections and to start things getting going. And then through the project, you will do all the connections, right? So I planned for that for this first permanent garden that it was happening with NYCHA, the, uh, the New York Housing Authority uh, project development in, in the Bronx. And after a year and a half, almost two years of community engagement, I learned that theory is not equal to practice. And that, they, that part of community engagement uh, that I was planned to do in six months, it was taking already, we were already a year and a half in and we were not even like halfway where we should be at. So that made me rethink completely my practice and rethink completely everything, my research, everything. And before I will develop I will, I will give 50% of the time to the creative process with the community and 50% or 40% to, to the community engagement that happens prior to that. Today, I give 60 to 70% to the community engagement and then everything else comes along after. And I don't have even like percentage for that. And I, it's, it's, it's just like, let's see what happens after that. So, and in my experience, in my own experience, it has been proved to be successful and to have better results and to create more sustainable uh, systems and more sustainable projects. Uh, because I think that that reality of like really creating a strong community uh, engagement prior to start developing even the creative practice uh, is what actually sustains the, the projects. And I can get, I mean, I, we can get more into detail as well down the line with other questions, but that, that will be my, my contribution for the question. Wonderful, thank you so much, Wendy. Uh Kevin, go ahead. Thank you, hello everyone. Um, I think I, uh, so my age a bit, I, I feel like I'm the B-side to Juan Lee's 45. You know, you got the great song of, you know, embracing chaos and I'm the other side that says, no, you must plan. And then hopefully through your plan that you find a way to, um, you know, recognize that chaos is going to happen, but the plan is going to lead you through. Yeah. And um, he was talking about the analogy that you often use, you know, the, the one that I teach students about uh, comes from this, you know, so-so movie called Backdraft, right? Kurt Russell and uh, Robert De Niro, some other folks about firefighters in, in Chicago, I think it was. And um, there's a scene where you see the firefighters go into a building and, um, you know, they're, they're engaging in fighting a fire. And all of a sudden, just everything just blows up around them, right? And, and they've got to figure out from their space you know, how do they get to safety? And so I tell students that, you know, often working in the real world, it requires you to stand in the fire, right? It requires you to recognize that all around you is, is going to be chaos. And then your job is to have the tools necessary to accomplish the goals, to overcome, not necessarily overcome the, the chaos, but at least manage the situation so that you can get to the uh, end that you're trying to achieve. So, you know, I come to this world um, from a very practical standpoint, right? I've, I've been in um, finance uh, most of my career in some capacity, either, you know, directly as, as a lender and an investor or as a consultant advising uh, financial intermediaries on how to make investments. And I also, you know, took that experience and I, I began to kind of think about you know, where I suddenly discovered the power of uh, art as a means of creating, you know, community change and community development. And I grew up in, in Brooklyn, you know, at a time where you really started to see um, art organizations sort of intentionally engage in community development. So one of the first, you know, memories is of uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation in, in Bed-Stuy which is a nonprofit community development organization that had a theater called the Billy Holiday Theater. And they used that as a way 
of, of helping to engage you know, local residents, both in, in production and performance, as well as in, in education um, around the arts. Also, um, when I was a, a kid, the, uh, we had the Brooklyn Children's Museum. And at one point they, they shut down the museum, but they created this satellite uh, called the Muse. Um, and that stayed in existence after the Brooklyn Ch Children's Museum reopened. And it was just really a, a community center for the arts where you could go, you know, free of charge or at some low price. And just, you know, I, I took photography at, at age 12. And, you know, having those kinds of, of opportunities really, you know, were, were enriching at, at an early age. And so um, when I came to the new school, I had the opportunity to teach a course called the Community Development Finance Lab, where I basically teach students sort of the core tenets of how capital can be used to create positive social outcomes. So, you know, how do you use uh, debt and how do you use equity and how do you use those tools to uh, build affordable housing or to um, start and, and manage uh, a, a community uh, health clinic or charter school? Um, but I also then wanted to combine my, my love of the arts with that and um, you know, would bring in uh, more and more this aspect of uh, community cultural development. The, the other key aspect of the course that I teach is that um, it is a, a project-based curriculum. So on the one hand, we're in the classroom learning, I'm teaching and, and helping students to grasp you know, these kind of sometimes esoteric uh, but very uh, formalistic uh, concepts about use of capital. And then we're also working with uh, actual organizations that are in teams and we, we have you know, a variety of community partners that we're working with. And I've always made sure that um, you know, one or more of those community partners was an arts organization. So over the years that uh, we've, we've worked throughout the United States, but you know, in the New York City area, we worked with the, the Bronx River Arts Center, or we worked with uh, Coney Island, USA, uh, Newark Symphony Hall, uh, Classical Theater of Harlem. Um, and so, they so the uh, students have an opportunity to see practice, see kind of theory, um, and, and bring the two together. And I, I think the, the key learning that I hope they take away is that when you, when you bring those two together, from their standpoint as students, that it's okay to fail. And, and I don't mean fail in the sense that you're getting a bad grade, but it's okay to engage yourself in the work and not necessarily come away with, you know, an, an answer uh, or, or a solution to something that sometimes the work itself is just going to lead to more questions. Um, sometimes it's not going to resolve immediately uh, some of the issues that you thought you were going to resolve. And, and just feeling comfortable with that. And I, I feel like if they can get comfortable with that sense that they can fail and it, in a protected environment like the university, then they'll be more comfortable once they go out into the real world and, and bring their knowledge to the, to the practice of, of either doing community-based development or, or whatever else that they're pursuing. Wonderful, Kevin, that's fantastic, appreciate it. Um, Jennifer, take it away. Yes, thank you, Pablo. It's so good to hear everyone's stories. They're resonating so much. Um, Nikki, how you were talking about stories, telling, how do you tell stories of someone who doesn't speak? It reminded me of so many oral histories that I've done where people aren't used to telling their story or they're not, you know, it's not in their interest to share it because of um, it could put them in danger or cause some exposure that they don't want. So it doesn't fit the mode. And then both Juan Lee and Kevin, you both talking about this chaos, <laughs> how to sort it out is just, that's like most of my life. <laughs> um, so I, uh, as Paula said, I, I work with a lot of um, museums and they tend to be social justice museums where I'm connecting histories with contemporary uh, social issues. And uh, they've been historic houses in particular. So they have these kind of site specific histories and in response to Pablo's prompt, I was thinking about it a lot and I was trying to think about like a really clear example of where the theory 
was in stark contrast to the practice. You know, it just completely fell apart because it's you can just tell a much better story that way. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't think of any that was that stark. And it made me kind of, you know, just sort of review um, how I translate that theory and practice in my own work. And, um, you know, to what the others, all of you are saying, it, it's, it's a lot messier in terms of how it plays out. It probably rarely goes how you plan, even with the structure. And I think that that's okay. Um, but it's not, it's not that stark, at least it hasn't been in my experience. And I can share, you know, I can share it. One, I have so many, but I can share one example of that. Um, in working with uh, Wixel Heritage Center, which I, I worked, you all know, I worked with them for about 10 years as we were restoring the historic houses and uh, recovering a number of histories. This is a tribute to uh, a free black community, a history that had never been, never really had been published, had been explored, had been talked about. Even people who know this general sort of slavery history, emancipation history didn't know. So um, it's uncovering a lot of stories that people don't know about. So um, in one instance, we, we had done a lot of research and we wanted, we were working with creative time in what would become, I was one of the five curators on the, the multi-site um, contemporary art exhibition called Funk God, Jazz, Medicine, Black Radical Brooklyn. <laughs> Uh, and each of those represent a research area of Weeksville. And so we had this plan that was, sounds very, you know, clear and idealistic where we were going to work with a contemporary artist and we were going to map them to a community partner and um, we would map that union to a research area pocket envelope with Weeksville. So it's like this kind of beautiful triad. Um, and, the, and there were a couple of objectives to this. One was that we wanted to really bring out that Wixel is not a dead history. It's not just about the past. It's about living community. You know, it's about the neighborhood that we're a part of, that we have a stake in. And so um, it was, and it was also uh, about, um, you know, acknowledging the um, existing businesses in the area, existing organizations and and that they're all part of this longer history. So, um, you know, that all sounds wonderful. And it worked out beautifully, I must say, but it took two years. <laughs> and so time is the thing for me. It takes a lot of cultivation because there's a lot of variables involved necessarily. So the artists, you know, the, the, the research areas or the community partners that we expected to map them with, they weren't necessarily interested in those. You don't know where they are, where they're at, what they want to work on. So that, you know, was one variable to work on for a while. Um, and the community partners, they, you know, they might know, they have uneven knowledge of, of Weeksville and the arts. And so they may know about the history. They may uh, consider their engagement with that, uh, you know, a little differently than we do. Um, so was, there was a lot of talking, a lot of meeting, a lot of cultivation, and then, uh, you know, introducing the partners to the community partners and also to try to ground them in our research. And of course, it never came out like the original plan <laughs> because of all the variables. So the one thing that I think I'm echoing with Juan Lee, you know, it takes time and it's important. There's no shortcut with cultivating those relationships, but they really are fruitful in how they kind of organically um, uh, support these projects and help them to blossom in ways that even you can't imagine, you know, and a lot of times we were just kind of the matchmaker um, and th you have to kind of meet people where they are and, and be willing to listen a lot and readjust a lot when needed. And so there was a lot of that, a lot of that. And this was the first time Creative Time had really done a huge Brooklyn. It was before the Kara Walker exhibit. So it was the first time they had really done a big contemporary art project like that in Brooklyn. So there was a lot of learning on all sides. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, would you like to go next or last, but not least? Yeah, sure. Um, Y'all can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, my apologies if I'm sounding a little uh, fatigued. Just did some bike riding from Brownsville. Um, so, so yes, I think it, kind of pointing to your analogy before, I, I think that was a really interesting way to way to phrase and frame the question because. Um, that that kind of gap or disconnect between 
professional practice and, and uh, industry and commerce and whatnot versus academia is, is always quite interesting to me. And uh, I've been thinking a lot <laughs> actually on that analogy and thinking, is it, uh, at least the way I'm looking at it now, I'm like, is it, is it reverse? Is it actually when you're in academia, you're, you're in this like free world or this huge spectrum of like possibility and that when you actually leave academia, you you get into this weird, uh, uh, very conflicting um, perception on what like industry and what professionalism is. Like it seems to be uh, to me very black and white, and that you're trying to incorporate light into this like very dark dark world of like uh, creative industry as well as um, uh, creative community engagement. Um, and so I've, yeah, I've just been thinking about that a lot since, since you mentioned it. And I feel like for me, that's, that's what it's been like. Um, uh, not so much in terms of working with communities, but more so getting things approved with, whether it be through agencies or other city, uh, city agencies or departments, that that was like actually where the challenge came in. And I, I felt like in terms of learning, about how to navigate um, the the post academia world, just feeling like if I guess just being really confident in the idea that oh if if the community says they want this you know water park for instance like we don't have to create a water park we can be very flexible on what that means it could just simply be sprinklers. But to kind of figure out how to be flexible and nimble with imagination and 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 I hate to use the word prototyping, but but the emphasis on like starting small um, and then scaling up. Um, I think also you know um, in proposing grand ideas uh, within the real world, I, I think I think a lot of times we're, we're taught we can't really do that after we graduate. And um, I think, you know, from a, from a teaching standpoint, you know, it becomes a little limiting. And I always like to think of teaching as like a feedback loop that we're not just like, you know, giving information or education to the students, but that, they, that I mean, I, that we're all kind of learning from them and we're all learning from this very rich, rich experience of, of where we're all at in our learning experiences. Um, so I, I, I think, um, and maybe I'm just also very optimistic of, of the future for students now versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago, <laughs> that, that what they're studying now is so entrenched with, with um, where we are socially and, and in society. Um, so as far as like an example or a couple examples from what I've seen so far. And I don't know if what I've been saying has been making any sense. I'm just <laughs> rambling at this point. Um, but uh, what I've seen so far is that it's it's definitely possible for that feedback loop to happen to where uh, it can inform or influence what what is possible in, in the real world and like completing a project. So for instance, I've been very much invested in, in learning more about uh, community trauma and its relationship to space and spaces of trauma after um, gun violent incidents um, and, and all the, the other uh, factors that play into it. A lot of the other deeper rooted issues that go along with um, violence. Um, and, and so, yeah, realizing, you know, I, once I studied it, once I did my research, I looked at all the precedents, did everything that academia told me to do um, as well as the industry, you know, you look up, you know, past, you know, works in other cities and, you know, references, and then you develop your design and then boom, it's problem solved, right? Um, but, but of course, that not being the case, whenever presenting stuff like that to um, providers that actually address some of those issues about, about these spaces after a traumatic event, that there's some hesitance on, on it and that they're not always receptive of it. Um, but when I prompted it in my studio um, and was actually uh, broadened, like with the students being more invested or, or being more involved in the process that they actually like 
came up with some really fascinating ideas um, and ha having those ideas and seeing the range of what's what's possible actually in showing that to the these staff members and providers of of or pretty much representatives of the community they are very embracing of of the the visions on what on how the students wanted to address these issues and i think it was partially because of just i guess i, I think it was just the imagination aspect of that they're able to like expand on on so many different topics and so many different touch points that they're able to see the full range and i and i think in my initial sharing of my ideas, I just did not have the capacity to give them something that was was uh, uh, sufficient. And so I, I think, yeah, I, I think it's it's we, we definitely have to figure out how to make sure that the transition between academia and professional work practice is is, is fluid. But I, I think it also kind of goes both ways. And I think with all of the practitioners here, that we're we're kind of providing that feedback loop and and um, and info to our students and vice versa. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, thank you all for your thoughts uh, and uh, for sharing all your experiences and ideas, which it's so interesting to see how they complement one another in your various projects that range from the pragmatic to the idealistic, which I think we all are at different levels, different points in our lives. Um, and the, the, the issue that I see normally with theory is that while it is essential uh, and critical for anybody in any profession, is that at the end of the day, it's a set of uh, fixed ideas and uh, concepts that when you go out there and apply, try to apply them to the real world, they don't always work because in that practice process, you know, they, there's always some sort of mismatch. So I guess my question really is to the, the, all of you, um, when um, teaching uh, a particular um, um, field or a particular public practice like this that we teach, what is really the most important skill to cultivate or to encourage? For example, um, what about improvisation or what I would term perhaps like a skilled improvisation, not simply like just try anything out, but try to be adaptable to what might come next and uh, have skills for adapting to, to uh, different realities. And also what will be the role perhaps of research of really uh, connecting with um, a particular reality to learn from it in order to apply what you've learned. And I think some of you have touched on that before, but I just want to throw it out there to see if any of you want to comment on this. I'll toss something in the mix. I wouldn't say it's the most important, but it is. Maybe we can generate a list, <laughs> but I, I think like uh, cultural humility, like a a, um, a a willingness to, I don't know, understand, acknowledge, and constantly sort of like be learning one's limits and not and and bringing that into um, exchange with anyone or like a community, um, and 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 really inviting and believing <laughs> that you have something to learn from another. And so part of that is like the, when I when you talk about theory, there's an act of translation, right? Like the language of theory. There's there's it, move into the real world, and it's funny. I always am insisting to my students that like this is also the real world. <laughs> like what we're doing right now is real. We're really here, even though we're not. You know, he, what does here mean? Um, but here Zoom well, or here? Yeah, you know, yeah. Here, here, there, everywhere, but. Like, you know, the, the translation required to bring theory into practice is something else that maybe we could think about or talk about. But I guess when I'm putting humility into the mix or cultural humility specifically, I, I think that being willing to relinquish the language of theory is connected to that in some way. Perhaps by not saying things like relinquish the language of theory 
Any other thoughts? Examples? Um, I haven't been focusing lately a lot on feeling and uh, on how to to address feelings, uh, both in, in in the practice, you know, like in, in my artistic practice, and also but also in the classroom, and how recognizing uh, those feelings, feelings of people, feelings of your students, feelings of myself when I'm teaching, you know, like the relationships that I establish with people, I, I think that it's very important. And I have been thinking a lot lately about like William's structures feeling. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, his, his work, his theory, uh, about like how you can actually recognize a, a collective feeling in an era through history, right? If you look at, uh, if you look at a, a certain time, and you look, go and look back, you can recognize certain like feelings collectively as a group, as a community, as a country, as a nation, as a... So I have been trying to like apply that into the classroom and what is the structure of feeling uh, in a classroom uh, or, or in between students or between me and the students and, and all that. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's, it's quite important because at the end of the day, believe it or not, we all take decisions with feelings. And like we all, uh, sometimes we feel uh, happy or we feel encouraged or we feel sad or we feel like a little bit um, hesitant of something and that feeling is going to inform the decisions we take that day. Um, Exhibit A, a uh, former president, was very much drive by his feelings uh, all the time and look at the disaster he created, right? So that is a horrible Exhibit A, but true. Uh, but we all do that. I mean, like we, we all, in a way, even we try to be professional and like keep it on to the tracks of like, no, this is super unprofessional. That is very unrealistic in my opinion. And like, I think that like recognizing that feelings are part of the work and everything that we do every day is very important too. Uh, Juan Lee, I wonder, uh, just to follow up on this statement, which I think is really interesting. Uh, I, I wonder if this is connected in any way with this process of intuition, which is so inherent to any artistic process because it seems to me that when you as an artist are pursuing something, you don't really know exactly why you're doing it always. Right? Yeah. And, and then like, you don't know the theory behind that. You only know that you have to do it. And then like later right. you kind of can better understand, but it seems that you are pointing at something that is much more intuitive, much that it does pertain emotions, but not, it has not been rationalized or theorized. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's almost the same as I am, Actually, that's a very good point to, to talk about like the creative process as this intu intuition that drives you and that drives us to create things is pretty much the same that, that I'm talking about in terms of like also being capable of like tuning in with uh, our feelings in that in that regard in in the teaching and also in the in, in the artistic practice as well. And even when we are being rational, uh, I think. I think it's important to like follow those those feelings. I also I encourage students uh, as a skill, and this is you know comes from work like Paul Stoller, who's an anthropologist, to pay attention to all of your senses, um, which kind of connects to intuition. So and also to pay attention to what we're privileging, because a lot of times sight is privileged, you know, over smells and. Um, it brings me back to how you opened, Pablo, how you opened it, you know, the, this session with learning everything about color in one way and then stepping into a colorful world when it's all integrated and in what you know and what you don't know. I think encouraging people to stay aware and pr as practiced as possible in, in acknowledging, um, you know, the many ways that knowledge is being taken in. Um, and which ones we privilege, and and it's a different way of listening, a different way of kind of integrating your world, 
um, you know, because I think theory has a has a tendency to kind of flatline some of the contours of experience. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, the five or six senses, depending <laughs> how many you all have. Some people have many more. I think it's important. Um, but there's an anthropologist who talks about how he, Paul Stoller, how he went to, I think it was West Africa. I can't remember if it was Senegal. You know, and everything that he learned was wrong because the experience was so overwhelming, just the, the smells alone, that he didn't have a way to talk about it or engage or talk, to talk about that part of the experience. Um, and so he, he, call, he developed something called sensual anthropology, which I think is important uh, in doing ethnographic work. Thank you, Jennifer. Do we have any questions from the group? Nikki, you ask, what is theory for? Can you <laughs> elaborate on your question? I was trying to, it was, it had to do with something that was said over here, but you know, this like, if we're thinking, you know, you're talking about following intuition into the making in, in, a, in the creative process. And then like, does theory, what kind of authority does theory have? What kind of authority does it need? What do we, give it what does it presume like does it is it sort of a retroactive sort of um stamp of meaning <laughs> what you know i i think that's what the question occurred to me when as in that context of like well what where where you would propose this provocation of like theory into practice but as emmanuel was saying like it goes the other way too like what is do we need theory in order to sort of I don't know. What do we need theory for? <laughs> we don't oh. have to take oh. that up. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, well, I guess um, uh, actually, and I guess just another like list of of um, not necessarily like rules or like guidelines, but like a skill that I would think students and even for, I guess, anyone doing this work perhaps is that idea of like challenging things or, or challenging theory or challenging pedagogy or, or ways of approach to something, especially in academia and in, in industry. And I think I'm only I'm only speaking from from like the very hardline architecture industry, which is feels very rigid um, and and very um, um, very late and it's it's way of approaching things in the present. So I'm, I'm very much a advocate for just challenging it and, and following your intuition and, and wanting to question, you know, or asking your professor, like, why or asking, you know, your, your boss, why? Um, I think even at my current job, which feels very hierarchical, um, uh, how the willing not to question it comes from you know the power dynamic and feeling like something that's being raised to, it, you can't raise something unless you're at a certain status so i i think uh, i think regardless like just one into or, or thinking that it would be beneficial that if students go through a certain program that that they they ask you know why they're doing it or why we are putting me through these classes uh, or, or courses to achieve this degree, or, or is is it flexible? Could y'all like actually have? Could I create my own class to meet these, you know, standards um, or objectives? Like, just always, always asking and challenging systems if it's if it's in your gut to do so. <laughs> Not that the other way isn't is wrong. I, that's that's the other thing. Like, there's no one way. I'm just saying that, that that could be beneficial as an alternative. So it seems to me that that when we when we are speaking about this, uh, I guess duality of theory and practice, uh, theory gets reviled a lot because you know uh, it's not in in our view the real world. But there seems to be also downsides of like diminishing the the importance of theory, the inability to generalize and be able to say. Oh, this thing that I'm doing actually obeys a pattern that that I can learn from. So, what is the case to be made for teaching somebody uh, a theoretical knowledge? 
I think, uh, hi, Papa, I'm wondering if I could just interject. Sure, you're, please. Uh, please, uh, please yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think one of the, I think, I think that the, you know, it's really fascinating. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So I really enjoy this conversation and you guys are so insightful and are, you know, bringing in references and associations and experiences that are, um, you know, really inspiring and, 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 and broadening. Along with this particular little dialectic is one thing that I've thought a lot about is instead of putting them in, in um, tension, um, the question of when in the, in the, in the learning and the pedagogy side of things, like when they happen, you know, so the extracting theory from practice as opposed to, you know, um, uh, introducing it first, but maybe first principles are, which are essentially theoretical are things. So like exactly how it's kind of calibrated from the receiving side of things, you know, to make it, um, that I will say, Stephen and I talk about this a lot, but this kind of phenomenon where students have super grasps of theoretical or even super gra grasps of technique, but they're isolated from the practice. So when they go into the practice realm, it's like they're starting over again. So kind of how to, you know, how to, um, what's the best way to kind of cultivate in young people, you know, um, or any kind of learning situation, you know, cultivate their their most inspired work, wanting them to have both the theoretical and the practical. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting observation. Even thank you. Um, I mean, I do, I do feel sometimes that in conversations about understanding a subject, I, I am often told, well, just tell me how it works. Just tell me what I need to do. Just give me the information. Just give me the specifics of what I need to do to succeed. You know, and the reality is like, there's no real particular formula to, to solve that problem, right? Like you need to understand in, in a broader way to know <laughs> that how you can f successfully function in it. Yeah, I mean, I think I, just to add one thing, I will say is like a lot of theory is built around constraints. It's how you imaginatively, creatively, using ingenuity, get around constraints. But until you've got your hands in it, constraints are a really hard thing to abstractly understand. Correct. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I guess the, the one observation that I've had is that I don't expect that the theory is going to stay with them very long that my goal is often to you know engage enough of a dialogue about what we're trying to do so that um th there is that, that germ of of a set of thoughts that they're going to maintain um but particularly if i'm thinking if i'm working with students whose practice will will not be financed right that no one's going to walk out of the courses that i teach and go right into Goldman Sachs. Um, they're gonna go into the Brooklyn Academy of Music. They're gonna go into some other you know, arts organization or some other you know, artistic endeavor. But what, what I hope to be able to do is that when they're in, when they're in that meeting because they, they have to be part of an organization and that organization has to think about financial issues in order to remain uh, viable, that some of the things that, that we covered and some of the dialogues that we, we had begin to resonate, but that they know kind of what is the information that, that they would need in order to make informed decisions. And so um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't really expect theory to really, to really last that long. I mean, it, the theory is probably more important to me than it is to them. And you know, my role is to say, you know, based on on how I've seen the world, how how does this this course of study relate to the things that that you might encounter at some point in in your own practice uh, in the future? Kelsey, oh. go go ahead, Nikki. Go ahead. I just wanted because Kevin, you post that. You brought backdraft into the room early on. So I had firefighters in my mind. 
like like people in chaos what do they need and so i started jotting down you know what do people what do i what would i need to get to chaos care love solidarity like fire hose you know equipment tools <laughs> tools to the task that meet the task but also like a sense of togetherness you know and not being alone and i one thing that strikes me about like the value or one value i i think i see in teaching theory or learning theory myself is like constantly a re kind of attenuating a sense of 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 kinship and like a, a lineage of learning a lineage of th of thought that is um and just the word line it suggests it keeps going you know that like it pre predated whatever i started learning when i started learning it and will keep going so this broadening of the um of the sense of the way in which the questions one is asking with their practice in their thinking in community um like those questions are have are a part of a lineage that is worth learning and and that there are and that students have something to offer in asking the questions forward great point um jennifer i, I wanted to ask you something about a uh, whole house which i was thinking about um it's a, it's a, it was a project that was created in these on the heels of the progressive era of education where i um Jean Adams and John Dewey were in dialogue, and and uh, I think they were she was perhaps influenced or involved with pragmatism and like the idea that you learn by doing. And I I just remember how they had these uh, I believe they had this labor museum where where um, those who were in the settlement would learn a, a specific uh, practices from people that actually were craftsmen or or other experts. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about. What, what you learn about this type of like a sure. theory versus practice that the whole house like a practice sure <laughs> i you know i became obsessed with the labor museum so the labor museum was this experiment that it didn't last for very long actually um at whole house um it was it was one of jane adams um uh projects actually where they started to see that um children um immigrants who were being born in these immigrant neighborhoods uh, were losing touch with their parents and traditions. And so it was at first created to connect girls with mothers, <laughs> this very sort of traditional way um, around these traditional practices, mostly of weaving, embroidery, needlepoint. Um, and people would actually dress up in their traditional dress costume and perform it almost like we would think of like a living history museum today like you, the person who turns butter <laughs> and those sorts of things um and then the finished product it was sort of like start to finish the finished product would then be exhibited in this museum and that was called the labor um museum um so it it um you know it, it broke down for all sorts of reasons but um initially it was this way to kind of connect these intergenerational arts. Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing about the arts of the settlement in general that I learned um, is a lot of people think of whole house of the settlement movement with social as social work as the, you know, kind of the predece predecessor of social work and social development. And very few people know how deeply embedded the arts was in that project. And so we did a whole sort of research project and exhibition uh, called Participatory Arts, where um, participation and collaboration and collective work were emphasized. But from the very beginning of the settlement, they were teaching painting and carpentry, and they had a tenure kilns program. And it was all to help people, of course, you know, integrate more into society, um, but also to become, what we would say, empowered and feel like they had... Um, some sort of um, stake in, in the community. And there was a very practical component about making money. So it was also to be a kind of antidote to the machine, you know, to the factory work that was happening that was really brutal and tedious and 
filling people's souls, you know. So this was supposed to be about putting yourself back into the world, work, being more connected to the hands-on. Um, some of the social reformers have these great quotes about doing hands-on work. Um, but it was, a, it was from the beginning a big part of social change and social work, and it was never disconnected. A lot of the um, artists who trained at the Art Institute taught at Whole House and vice versa. A lot of artists exhibited who trained at whole house exhibited at the art institute they saw whole house is kind of the affordable <laughs> art institute the community art institute a lot of people don't know this you mentioned improv whole house is the birth of improv Paolo. it second city the now the comedy preview started at whole house and it was a part of this kind of educational learning practice so uh, they had like a 300 seat theater and they taught like neighbors they call them neighbors um uh, how to do theater and how to produce, you know, these sort of traditional performances, but also write their own and perform. Uh, and they were very participatory with the audience. So people used to come from all over the city to kind of see these sort of off-Broadway <laughs> shows at the social settlements. It's a really interesting history that, that people haven't uncovered, but the arts was really vibrant in all of that. So anyway could go on <laughs> yeah jennifer thanks for bringing that up i i think i may be wrong i think viola spolin who's sort of the, yep. the mother of of improv she is. Uh, did start out there and also i just wanted to, to bring another really interesting compare and contrast that i've often thought about is a Bauhaus and hull house uh, which were very different in a lot of ways but also shared a lot um particularly on the making things, particularly on the tr traditional crafts and the relationship between crafts and commerce. Um, so it's just, it's really super fascinating. Thanks so much for bringing that up, um, Pablo and Jennifer. So. You're totally yeah, right. It was, it's a really Viola interesting Spolin relationship. Was, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, well, she was one of the social reformers and her son was Paul Seals who started Second City. And he he's in a lot of the photographs of Whole House participating in the, the theater program. <laughs> Yeah, and I, as I recall, I think Bauhaus, one of the early masters of uh, the Bauhaus was uh, Johannes Eaton, who was really interested in performance. And uh, and he had an entire uh, practice where the students needed to have specific diets and, and, and eat garlic and have different kinds yeah, of... Yeah, well, that, yes, yeah, that did not last long. <laughs> they, yes, they tossed him out, Pablo, but, um, <laughs> but they did perform some theater. Yeah, they... <laughs> well... Um, do we have any last questions from anybody about this um, topic? I, I like how Juan Lee talked about the idea of risk and chaos as an MO, and then Kevin replying that, you know, we should plan for chaos. So the question is like, what, what to do with chaos? Should we plan for it? Should we, are those two things compatible? Plan, hope for the best, plan for the worst? Actually, I took a note after Kevin <laughs> answered my statement, and I said that like we should like perhaps embrace chaos as a plan, <laughs> right? This is like, can we can we grasp that? You know, like can we like think of chaos as a plan? That's the plan. The plan is to like be in chaos. But like, um, I just want to say that like when I was like thinking about chaos, I mean like we have an understanding of chaos that is like kind of daunting and like uh, all over the place, but it's not the case. I mean, like if, if, if everything is, even chaos is under control, if you, if you may, if you want, you know, like everything is balancing, everything is an equilibrium, everything is always like, you know, um, <clears throat> moderating each other, like uh, themselves. And, and that's, how it's, that's how chaos works. That's, how, that's what the definition of chaos is. But that's how I see it. It's just like it's it's just like being ready to react and manage. Uh, yeah, that that chaos and like embracing the chaos of the planet. Is that is that good enough, Kevin? Or can we take that as a yes? Embrace it. Embrace the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the pandemic has thrown us into this type of territory and. Uh... Now we can theorize about it. You know, something that I, I, when I teach how to do an oral history interview, I like it because it's like a container for, I always say like you, you prepare to be unmoored, you know, like you have a sense of what you make a plan. The plan is for you <laughs> to sort of alleviate. You're like, I've done my planning, I'm ready. But like out the window, when you start, you know, you ask your first question, you have a sense of what's important to you 
what questions you bring, but you're really there to discover what's important for them to share with you. And so like this, a way of being in, I mean, it's helpful in that it's rarely more than three hours. <laughs> so it's a manageable unit of chaos, but like having a sense of what is important to you, like a sense of purpose and combined with like a, maybe a set of like guiding principles for improvisation, improvisational listening, or sort of, yeah, like a sense of what is what is important, but not um, adhering to any, I don't know, the plan is not to be executed, it's to be, a, it's a process point, it's sort of to help you come in with a good, a, a better sense of what's important, and then see what happens. It, it also, I, I was just in what Pablo just said about, I mean, Pablo, you just referenced the whole COVID, like everything of this past year, throwing everything up into chaos. But in a way, I think that the past year actually proves a, a, a useful example for the whole question of this conversation, that it's in these moments where literally nothing can be counted on, that theory actually becomes most important because in the absence of it, then everything is just like, you don't even know where to turn. So having those sort of guiding threads in the real kind of tempest when things truly turn upside down becomes particularly useful. Yes, absolutely, Stephen. And I think it, it's, it, it, we also, I don't, know if, I don't know if we can say it's a good thing, but, but the, the pandemic has caused us to create a, a revaluing of what's important or in art making and in life, right? Like what, what are the things that really truly matter uh, to us? And uh, perhaps these might have an impact on how we think about or way of working in the future, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's, I agree. And I think what you're referencing also, both of you is a kind of, to get back to sort of extraction, taking your experience and um, um, figuring out what has been essential and what is essential, and then recognizing the theory behind that. And I think that's so, that's the kind of tricky moment with students who haven't, aren't drawing on as much experience. So it, it's it's just a, a further away from, um, from that. Um, and I think we're always trying to, you know, we want to be able to just let, uh, let them absorb that without the experience, but of course they have to go, uh, they have to go through it. But Nikki, I was also thinking, and Stephen and I kind of talk about this a lot, like in directing, we talk about the difference between preparing and planning. And preparing is very good. And planning is, you know, often a nightmare because it's your expectations of what it's controlling, right? So the difference between being prepared for the chaos and thinking that you're going to control the chaos. <laughs> You actually, uh, Pippin, you actually brought something up here that for me is very important, expectations. And that's actually something that I was thinking in bringing up to the conversation as well, in terms of like the theory and the practice. And that, that is perhaps one of the most important differences, right? It's like we have the theory and the theory creates expectations, but then the practice never meets. And, uh, or, I mean, sometimes it does, but... Uh, yeah, I was thinking about that as well when when you, Pablo, ask about <clears throat> how to manage this dichotomy in the classroom. And it's about like, yeah, managing expectations as well. Students have a lot of expe expectations as well from this theory, right? In the last questions, thoughts, comments? I just want to say that I think one of, uh, just to add, I know I've been talking a lot, so I'm just crashing this whole thing, but I really, it's so, so important to continue the dialogue with people from really different disciplines, because I think it's the biggest learning, at least for me, the way I learn. It's, it's just so hugely important to find out where these connections are and think about questions you've thought about, but with new insights and from kind of different directions. So I really, really appreciate it. And I've always appreciated that about, I've always knew, known it exists at the new school and we always feel it has so much potential to even um, do more of. And, you know, um, so I'm just really appreciative and, and a lot of gratitude for all of you, for, you know, contributing.
Thank you, Pip, and this, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we, when we started these conversations, uh, we were focusing a lot on multidisciplinary knowledge and, and uh, basically how do we, what do we learn from other areas and how do we talk about like equivalent types of knowledge from different fields, which is something that uh, I feel is important as we go in a, in a, in a work that is of this nature. Um, and certainly like the relationship between like, you know, knowing something and then uh, in theory and in practice is connected to that. But I just want to thank everybody, uh, our amazing panel of uh, colleagues who have pitched in with their thoughts. And, uh, and as we retransition into, I guess, like the real world, <laughs> if, if this is or this start to become real and like the other world feels now unreal, but if, in whatever way that transition happens, you know, we, we, um, we look forward to continuing these conversations with all of you. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you in the fall. <laughs>